All right, I'll go ahead and get started. I want to welcome all of you to today's Seek Space webinar series. Today's webinar from Dr. Michelle Cote is about somatic mutations and high grade endometrial cancers. Before we introduce our speaker, I would like to view uh, a few webinar logistics. During this webinar, all lines will be in listen only mode. You may submit your questions at any time using the Q&A or chat panel and selecting all panelists. And Tabitha Harrison will ask your question on your behalf during the Q&A session. Note you may need to activate the appropriate panel by using the menu option found at the bottom of your screen as shown in this figure. And with the, the dots, you can open the Q&A panel. Closed captioning is available as a link in the chat box if you need it, and this webinar is being recorded. And with that, I'm going to pass the microphone to Fred Schumacher, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you. Dr. Michelle Cote is a professor of oncology at the Wayne State University School of Medicine and the Associate Center Director for Education at the Carmanos Cancer Institute. The focus of Dr. Cote's research is the intersection of molecular epidemiology and health disparities. Specifically, she is interested in examining genetic and molecular factors in lung and female cancers that impact disease occurrence or prognosis in underserved populations. Highlights of her previous work include the first report in African Americans of increased risk of lung cancer associated with familial aggregation of lung cancer and assessment of somatic mutations in endometrial tumors from African American women. In this webinar, Dr. Cote will be presenting on somatic mutations in high grade endometrial cancers. And now, Dr. Cote. Hello, everybody. Uh, hopefully, I'm able to share my screen here. All right. Hey, you guys good. are seeing? Looks good. Excellent. So, thank you um, for the introduction and for the invitation to present my work here today. Um, before I kind of launch into the main part of my presentation, I want to provide a bit of background information about endometrial cancer as it's understudied compared to a lot of other cancers. So you might not be as familiar with it. Um, you might hear me when I'm talking and when I'm presenting data kind of flip back and forth be between saying uterine cancer and endometrial cancer. So endometrial cancers are a subset of uterine cancers, but they're the primary type. Um, these are the cancers that arise from the endometrium um, compared to something like, say, a uterine sarcoma. So you'll hear me flip back and forth. My work, um, my tumors are all endometrial tumors, but some of these data that I'm going to present are, are uterine cancer data. Going forward. There we go. All right, so with that said, um, you know, while the incidence rates overall for cancers are dropping in this country, primarily due to the decline in lung cancers, uterine cancer is actually on the rise. So this is analysis of the CDC National Program of Cancer Registries along with SEER data. Um, the next slide will show mortality data from the National Vital Statistics System. And what you can see is that the age and in adjusted increases over the last 15 years or so in endometrial cancer. And what you'll notice here is the AAPCs, or the average annual percent change, um, is increasing for all racial and ethnic groups, but especially for non-white women. And what you know, this tells us is that um, this is a continuing public health problem and something that we need to, to start focusing on a little bit more. Next slide here shows it's similar in format. This is the rate of uterine cancer deaths per 100,000 women. And the most notable thing about this slide is that one, it's also increasing over time, but two, um, the rate in black women is almost twice that of all of the other racial and ethnic groups. So you're seeing increases in death rates over time. You're seeing these death rates about two times um, higher among black women than other, other racial and ethnic groups. So to kind of set up the high grade portion of my talk, I want to take a step backwards and talk about how endometrial cancers were originally classified. So most papers, um, even now, still use 
this type one or type two classification that was developed um, by Bochman in 1983. And most of it is based on um, the types of subtypes you see in, in ovarian cancer. So we talk about things like endometrioid, endometrial cancer, serous endometrial cancer, clear cell endometrial cancers, and so on. So the nomenclature was really taken from ovarian. Um, this classification system you know, is still really relevant today. Um, if you look, um, they note that for type 1 tumors, they're the most common tumors. 60 to 70 percent of endometrial cancers are, are of this type. Um, you note that they tend to be lower grade. Um, they tend to have better um, prognosis. And you look at the, out, the five year outcome of 86 percent. That's still about the outcome that we see today for these, these type 1 tumors. Type 2 tumors, on the other hand, they're less frequent. Here they say 30 to 40 percent. I would say it's, it's probably a little bit lower than that. Um, but the, and they're associated with high grade tumors. Um, worse fact, clinical factors, such as myometrial invasion, um, the potential for spread is much higher among these, these type 2 tumors. And ultimately, that leads to a lower five year um, overall survival of about 60%. And again, our, the rates over the last 30 or so years of survival rates for endometrial cancer are pretty stagnant. And some data even suggests that they're getting slightly worse. Now, there was a really nice analysis that was done um, by, by Megan Clark um, at the NCI about two years ago in the Journal of Clinical Oncology. And what they were able to do here was to incorporate the rates of hysterectomy in the population and kind of overlay it onto some of these other estimates of disease incidence. So this first panel here, panel A, um, you'll see in the blue is the uncorrected rate, and this is um, incidence over time. And the red is once you correct for the 30 to 40 percent of, of women, uh, who have a hysterectomy. So what you notice then, because that's a change in the de denominator, is that the rate is actually increased. So that's panel A. Panel B and C, they split their data, not quite like the type 1 and type 2, but they split it into endometrioid and non-endometrioid subtypes. So you can tell from looking at the, um, the y-axis that the endometrioid subtypes are the most common subtypes. And again, those are the type 1 cancers. And you can see there that the lines, both corrected and uncorrected, are, are relatively flat, particularly the corrected one over time. So the increases in incidence are really coming from what you see in panel C. So these are the non-endometrioid subtypes. These are the more aggressive tumors, the serous carcinomas, the clear cell carcinomas. And you see a pretty significant change over time. What's also concerning about this is that these tumors, these non-endometrioid tumors or these high-grade tumors, are also um, more frequent in African American women. So I kind of take the middle road here. Um, if, if there's lumpers and splitters in pathology, um, I guess I'm a bit more of a splitter because I spend too much time perhaps with pathologists. Um, so here you kind of see an extension of the two types of tumors. And it recognizes subtype. And what it recognizes it is that these endometrioid tumors can be both either low grade or high grade. And so you know, these endometrioids, it's the largest histologic type. And so this split um, allows us to kind of look at what the prognosis is in these high grade endometrioid tumors um, because they shouldn't really be just lumped into these low grade uh, tumors. They've got kind of an intermediate phenotype between the serous and clear cell and the endometrioid. So this is pretty much the classification that I follow in most of my work. Um, and then this was also the classification I used um, when, when selecting my population. So this is another background slide. This is the, kind of the final one of, of the straight epidemiology stuff. Um, it's work that we published in 2015. It, it mirrors the findings of, of Clark, um, but this manuscript did not adjust for hysterectomy as hers did. But what we do show is that overall, 
The high grade tumors are about twice as frequent here in black women, particularly for serous cancers. That's the panel to your right. And um, the, they're rarer in the population than, as I said, the other subtypes, um, but they're responsible for the largest proportion of deaths from endometrial cancer. All right, and since the title of the R01 that supports this work is the molecular classification of high grade endometrial cancers, extending TCGA findings to a diverse population, I felt like I should at least show a little something from the Hallmark TCGA paper that came out in 2013. So what you can see here is this is kind of their big summary graphic um, that identified four molecular subtypes in endometrial cancers based on mutational burden, microsatellite instability, and copy number variation primarily. So if you direct your attention to the bottom lines that are gray, the histology and the tumor grade, you'll see here that the last cluster, the copy, copy number high serous-like cluster, um, contains most of the high-grade tumors followed by the MSI hypermutated and then the full ultramutate, full E ultramutated tumors. Um, as, as noted in this last slide, most of these high grade tumors reside in, in these categories. So I, this was part of my grant application. I wanted to tease apart a little bit more of these molecular subtypes. And so it's, much of this information was contained in the last figure but here it is in, in table form for people who like it this way a little bit better. Um, I should note that this is based on just 232 tumors at the time and fewer than 10% of the samples were from African American women. The research has grown, it's, it's much more diverse now, um, has much better, better representation. Um, but there's a few things to note. If you look in the middle, um, of the rows here, looking at the significantly mutated um, somatic variants, you'll note that there's a few that are pretty common across all subtypes. P10, P3CA um, are, are pretty common across, across all. Um, as noted in, again, the last slide, these copy number high um, contain most of the serous tumors in the cell. One more background slide that I think most people who are on this call would be familiar with. Um, this is the Cosmic Resource, the Catalog of Somatic Mutations and Cancer. And the website is, is here on the screen for you, as well as one of, one of their publications. What the Cosmic Resource does is it compiles ex expert manually curated somatic mutation information with a focus on human cancers. Over the last five years, they're up to version 94 that was just released this May. They have information from over 1.5 uh, million samples, including nearly 40,000 whole genomes, and they've identified over 23 million uh, mutations. So, of course, this is not specific to any one cancer type. It's multiple cancer types. It's user-friendly. You can go in, you can select your cancer site and get some specifics about histology even, and generate data, um, such as lists of the most commonly mutated genes. So I also wanted to highlight a, a second reference here um, that talks about the cosmic signatures that have been developed. And there's kind of four different signatures you can look at. You can look at single base signatures, double base, clustered, and then small insertion and deletion. I'll show you some work later using the single based substitution cosmic signatures. And an example of of one of the signatures, SBS3, is shown here below. So, you know, briefly, what these signatures do is they um, kind of decompose the individual contribution of, of each of your tumor um, samples into this reference set of these 49 mutational signatures. And so, you know, you think about the tumor and it's not just comprised of one signature, it's comprised of multiple of these signatures. And the higher percentage of, for any one signature, the closer the sample's profile is aligned with that signature. So many of these signatures have been um, characterized, such as being associated with defective DNA match repair or poly mutations, but others are still unknown. So this one here, SBS3, 
has been strongly associated with germline and somatic BRCA1 and 2 mutations in breast, pancreatic, and ovarian cancers. And I'll get back to, to this and using cosmic signatures a little bit more when I talk about some of the additional filtering of our whole exome sequencing data we did. And then also trying to integrate these signatures into models to predict survival. So the goal of my work, which, which we refer to as EndoSeq, was to create to increase the number of high-grade cancers with whole exome sequencing data, as well as well-annotated clinical data to provide insight to factors associated with poorer prognosis. So most of what I'm gonna show here today is focused on AIM-2, although I'll tie in AIM-1 a little bit at the end, and we've still got some great, great data uh, incorporating some pro targeted proteomics into these analyses as well. So what does my population look like? So we identified women with high-grade endometrial cancers from two academic um, health centers here in Detroit, Carmanos Cancer Institute and Henry Ford Health System. Our main hospitals are just over a mile apart. We, we serve the four, 4 million residents of metropolitan Detroit. So I wanted people with, with high-grade tumors, serous, clear cell, or mixed subtypes. Um, as, long, as well as the high-grade endometrioid. Um, the diagnosis dates are, are pretty long, like I said, or it's a broad range. Um, you know, this is a, these are relatively uncommon tumors. And because I was particularly interested in outcomes, I wanted to have at least five years of follow-up. Um, we did earlier stage tumors. So many of these cancers, most of these cancers, unlike ovarian, are diagnosed in um, earlier stages. Um, but we wanted these women to be eligible for surgical treatment because we were interested in having their tumors um, for our analysis. We use medical record race and ethnicity um, for women who are recorded as, as non-Hispanic white or non-Hispanic African American. If you guys know anything about the metropolitan Detroit area, these are our primary two populations. Um, we, have, we have very few Asian Americans, very few Hispanic Americans at, at this point, although just like the rest of the country, we're also becoming more and more diverse. So I promised I would show the good, bad, and the ugly here. And so um, we had each potential case. We identified over 600, 601 cases between our two institutes, and we had them reviewed by a single study pathologist, Dr. Ruba Ali Fami. Uh, she specializes in gynecologic cancers, and she performs similar reviews for TCGA. So that's the good. I, I feel very confident in our pathology work. The bad and the ugly are kind of these little losses along the way, which add up to just a really significant reduction in your final data set. You know, we powered everything initially by, by thinking we would have about 500 tumors. And as you can see, we really didn't get there. The large number of ineligible cases here, the 185, and you know, that represents kind of a third of the cases, the loss there. Um, it isn't so much that the pathology reports were wrong. It was more so that once we were able to pull the files, sometimes you could find two or three slides with two or three corresponding blocks. Sometimes you could find 30. And as you know, you know the, um, the grade of the tumors varies even across the tumors. You know, it isn't necessary that there's there's only high grade areas. So sometimes we pull cases that were listed as high grade, but indeed the only tissue remaining was low grade or even no cancer at all. So this is kind of where where things fell out. Um, but ultimately, our final data set was 290 um, tumor pairs. So all of our genomic and proteomic work was sent to our colleagues at the Department of Defense's Gynecologic um, Center of Excellence. Their laboratory is housed at the Inova Health System. Um, they went back and they kind of assessed the tumor cellularity again, and specimens that had less than 70% tumor cellularity were additionally harvested by laser microdissection to enrich the final sample to 70% to or better. And from there, as you can see, the DNA isolation and extraction, the sequencing library preparation and generation, and the purification all followed the standard manufacturer protocols. The next generation full exome sequencing or next gen sequencing is done using Illumina's Novaseq 6500. 
So here are the characteristics of the endoseek population. Um, you see our, our primary two subtypes are endometria and serous. So we did have some mixed tumors. The mixed normally refers to endometrioid and serous, um, but sometimes we do have, have some clear cell mixed in there as well. Um, we stages, again, this is going to be biased towards earlier stage cancers, uh, just because of our requirement for meeting the tumor tissue. Age of diagnosis, so the average age of onset of of endometrial cancer is the early 60s, 62, I believe, most recently. Um, and we're skewed a little bit younger than, than maybe what's expected. 57% of our population is African American. That isn't unusual. That's the population we serve. Um, Carmanos probably serves a larger African American population than Henry Ford does. But again, 25% um, of the metro area is. Um, is, is African-American, and 56% of our population um, was deceased or, or died at some point during the study period. And of those deaths, almost 70% were endometrial cancer related. So I'm gonna just briefly mention here, and we'll talk about it again. Our endoseek population was a little bit different than the TCG, TCGA population. We, we had more serous tumors, from proportionately speaking, um, stage was the same, but age at diagnosis, ours were slightly younger, more African American, and we had we had more women who were deceased. All right, so I, I think maybe we're getting into um, the bad or the ugly again, but um, you know, we we knew that um, we were going to have some issues potentially with artifacts. So an important difference also between TCGA and our data is that TCGA used fresh frozen tissue and then germline DNA for normal tissue, whereas all of our tissue, uh, normal and all of our DNA, um, all came from formulin fixed paraffin embedded tissue, so FFPE tissue. And the majority of our normal tissue came from uninvolved myometrial tissue. So with formulin um, being 4% formaldehyde that's used to fix the tissue so that we can look at these tumors from you know, 1997, um, we know that the, that the formaldehyde penetrates the biospecimen and it generates DNA damage that leads to uh, deamination of cytosines. And that results usually in an overabundance of either C to T or A to G substitutions. And additionally, there's a strand read orientation bias also introduced. So to start with, we, we followed what the Broad Institute um, pipeline is um, using their genome analysis toolkit here. And our initial screen, which you know, again, did not filter out any of these artifacts, um, it came up with you know, 1.3 million variants. So, we did look at those, and there did look to be excessive you know, C to T mutations. So we did a second analysis here, and this is based off of some of the, the cosmic work. Um, this was using this non-negative matrix factorization. I say we as the global, global we. This is um, Dr. Greg Dyson and uh, Doug Craig, who are our um, study biostatistician and bioinformaticist, respectively. Um, but this analysis really provided additional evidence, as you can kind of see in a glaring way here from that middle column, where you see a lot of red lines, um, that these were signatures that are associated with contamination or with these, these artifacts from this formula and fixation. So in particular, um, these signatures SVS23 and SVS30 um, have been, which I've highlighted here, um, they've been implicated as um, transcriptional strand bias and cytosine um, deamination, respectively. So we tried, uh, there was, there's new methods coming out all the time in the literature. We tried a couple um, that can filter these data again and remove some of these artifacts. Of course, there's a balance here. You don't want to throw you know, the baby out with the bathwater, as they say but you know you're going to lose some calls that are probably good 
in an effort to reduce these, these false calls. So ultimately, um, we went with another filter in, in MUTEC. Um, it's, it's the read orientation quality scores, or ROQ. And we identified a threshold that eliminated 78% um, of these T to C mutations, but only 10% of other mutations. And so this reduced set was again analyzed. It was compared again to the Cosmic Signatures database. And we didn't see this evidence of artifacts that we saw you know, before we did the second filtering. So our final filter then ultimately resulted in removal of about 850,000 variants that left us with um, about 512,000 for the rest of these analyses. So moving on from there, what did we find? Um, you know, first, you know, in our data, endometrial tumors had a greater um, mutational burden, as you can see here. Um, these are all mutations. It held true for the functional mutations as well. Um, I should note one frustrating thing going through the literature is really, you know, you have to do a really deep dive in some of these papers to figure out what they're actually showing you when they talk about mutations. And, you know, I've, I've learned that not everybody is presenting functional mutations, they're presenting all mutations. And so how we defined functional mutations here was using Anabar. So those were variants that were, were splicing mutations, um, frame shift, insertion, deletion, or substitution mutations, non-frame shift, shift of the same, um, stop gain, stop loss, um, or had at least 50% um, of the functional callers, things like SIFT and polyphen, that identified the site as deleterious. Um, variants that were listed in the ClinVar database were also deemed functional. So across these 290 samples, there were 129, almost 130,000 somatic variants observed. Um, for an average of 448 and a median of 204, 204 I'm sorry, um, variants per sample. Um, when you stratify by histology here, you see that these endometrial cancers have the most variants, while the serous samples have the fewest when you're comparing medians, um, with these endometrial tumors having about 2.5 times the number of variants. And that was a statistically significant comparison. Next thing we looked at was microsatellite instability. You'll, you'll remember that this was one of the defining characteristics in the TCGA4 um, subtypes. Um, we know that MSI status also has some therapeutic implications for endometrial cancer, particularly with immunotherapies. It's also can be an indicator of Lynch syndrome in families. So here we use two programs, Mantis and MIS sensor, at almost identical results, which is always nice to see. And we were able to identify tumors that fell into kind of one of one of three buckets. And so the black here are the serous cancers that were low or microsatellite stable. Um, the, in the red are those that are kind of mid-range. And then the green are those that are microsatellite high. And you can see that the serous tumors are much less likely to have microsatellite instability or be microsatellite in stable positive um, compared to the other subtypes here. Uh, right. There we go. So again, I'll, I'll go back through just real quick because I'm going to start comparing our two data sets. Um, EndoSeq, we've, we've got these high grade only. They included the clear cell cancers in um, FFP tissue for both of our DNA sources, larger proportion of tumors from African American women. And we've got longer follow-up, and we've also got more deaths. I should note, though, that when we analyzed the TCGA data, we went back and we refiltered the calls in the same way described as, as I did earlier for how we processed our endoseq samples. So, of course, the filtering, the elimination wasn't as severe because the TCGA sequence data came from these fresh frozen um, tumors in germline DNA. So they, they weren't dealing with the artifact issues that we were. So yes, looking at our, um, our endometrioid tumors, so the majority of our um, MSI 
positive tumors were the endometriate subtype. Um, so I've restricted the analysis so that we're kind of trying to compare apples and apples here. Uh, and you'll see, I pulled the top 10 most commonly mutated genes here. And you see that there's an overlap of about three genes. And so um, KT, KMT2D is a histone lysine methyl transferase. It's also known as MLL4 or MLL2. Um, it appears to have cell dependent functions, um, but in hematologic cancers, it seems to be a tumor suppressor. Nothing really about it or described yet in endometrial cancer. 61% of the MSI tumors from both TCGA and um, endocyte um, had mutations. This was a little lower, only about 20% in these microcephal stable tumors. Um, MUC16, mucin 16 also known as CA125, should be very familiar to some of you. It's been used as a biomarker for ovarian cancer, and its expression has been associated with disease progression. In these MSI endometrioid tumors, these high-grade tumors, about 40% um, are mutated. It's about half of that in the stable tumors. And then finally, this last one, this RYR1, has, has absolutely no known function in cancer. It's actually, it's the skeletal muscle ryodine receptor 1. It's a really big gene, which is probably part of the reason it's showing up as one of the top mutations, because, of course, these larger genes have more opportunities um, to mutate. Um, but it was found in about a third of our MSI tumors and about 20% of the microcellular instability. So what was really notable was that the frequencies of the functional mutations in these lists was very similar across the two data sets, with one kind of painful, um, notable exception, and that was P10. So, you know, the P10 mutation here, if you look um, to the far left, if you look at everybody, um, P10 is probably one of the best studied tumor suppressor genes, period, but particularly in endometrial cancers. And you can see that this orange line of the TCGA tumors, 74% of the tumors, these endometrioid tumors, not stratified yet by microsatellite, um, harbored a mutation compared to only 28% of those in our population. If you do stratify by MSI, again, you see that um, MSI compared to microsatellite stable tumors um, have more mutations, even just overall, but also in P10. Um, but the, the difference isn't being driven by an imbalance of MSI. We're seeing it in, in both the MSI and the MSS tumors. So God is asking, you know, what could really be driving this? So, you know, we know that the endocyte population is a larger proportion of African-American women compared to TCGA. Um, you know, and I want to note here, as, as I'm also just kind of being sloppy in my use of, of race and ethnicity, that race is a social construct, not a biological one, although we do have ancestry data for these women that will be available soon. Um, but based on this analysis, it really doesn't appear that race is making all that much of a difference here, um, although you should note that some of the sample sizes in the groups here get pretty small. If you look at the microsatellite tumors, um, the for African American women, the TCGA only contained nine women. We weren't that much better, frankly, in endoseek at a, at a whopping 13. But it doesn't really look like race is playing a big role here. So the question is then, of course, what is? So, you know, there's of course the possibility, and I think that this has been shown, that P10 is an early mutation event in carcinogenesis. There's been some great work coming out in the last year. And I apologize for not having a reference. There's a really good one in the endometrium um, that, that really shows that we have a lot of somatic mutations that could be considered driver mutations for cancer in what we think is normal tissue that doesn't ever develop into any kind of precancer or you know, cancerous lesion. Um, so P10 may just be something that was much more prevalent in our normal, you know, myometrial um, adjacent tissue, that it looked from, you know, a pathologist standpoint, like normal uninvolved tissue, but indeed it wasn't. And so that means if we saw it in what we, you know, if we saw the mutation in what we thought was normal, um, you know, and then we saw it again in the tumor, 
it, it would not be considered a somatic mutation. But what's curious to me about that is that we're really seeing it here just for P10. All of the others looked, looked about the same. So that's one possible explanation. The other is, well, did we just over aggressively filter out all of these mutations? And so we looked at that um, and we did not in P10 um, you know, take out too many of those, um, those mutations that were associated with, with the FFP artifacts. And then we also used the same filtering on the TCGA subset as well. So it didn't seem like that was it, but biospecimen issues just broadly could be one of the differences. Another one is that this could just be a platform specific issue. Um, you know, while we did rerun the pipelines, you know, we, we did not resequence these, these data from TCGA. So the sequencing platforms were at least a decade um, older than, than what we used. So that might be one reason. This is another one is that TCGA is just overestimating. Um, and so I went back to the Cosmic Cancer Browser and I looked at their endometrioid tumors. And so they had over, um, readings for over 2,000 um, endometrioid samples in their database. And they saw that 56% um, were mutated. And so that kind of is, is right between, um, you know, where our endoseq numbers came and, and where the um, TCGA numbers came. So I've you know, my biostatistician can tell you in, in my research group, I've been, you know, somewhat focused on let's look at the top genes, let's do this. I'm not convinced we have the data, and I mean we not just with endoseq, but I mean as a broader community, to really be able to say these are, are the most commonly mutated, and what we really don't have the data for yet are to look at mutations that are of lower frequencies, you know, 10% or even 5% or less. So with that, um, I'll show you these kind of with my tail between my legs. These were the frequently mutated genes in Cirrus. But instead of saying, I'm going to take the top ones in endoseq or I'm going to take the top ones in TCGA, which had a lot of overlap, I'm, I went back to the cosmic data set. They have about 205 um, Cirrus endometrial cancer, center, cancer centers, endometrial cancers represented there. And um, so I, I only selected ones where they had tested at least 100 tumors, because that kind of put us in line with endoseq and TCGA. And you see kind of the usual suspects here, which, which was good to know. Um, the, the P53 mutations, the P3CA mutations, you know, the PP2R1As, these are kind of the um, most commonly mutated um, genes in serous cancers. And it was also kind of a relief to see that we didn't see much difference between these, these three different resources. I will say, though, that um, COSMIC does include, I don't know if they include all of these TCGA, but they do include some of the TCGA data. So there may be some overlap here between COSMIC um, and the TCGA. So it's um, difficult to, to draw conclusions, especially in some of these you know, less frequently mutated genes, but um, I, I think it's still a worthwhile effort, but I, I think I've been really kind of focused or maybe even fixated on it, and um, I shouldn't be. So with, um, now I've shown you, you know, MSI, some of the most commonly mutated genes, whether you want to believe it or not. So let's get back to these cosmic signatures. So what we were able to do with, with these filtered, double filtered data that removed the artifacts, or hopefully did, is um, to, to construct these cosmic signatures. So what we did is we computed the relative contribution of these signatures for each of the individual cancer genomes. And what we were able to do is identify five signatures as the most abundant mutational signatures that closely match our data. And you can see the signatures listed here with their proposed etiologies. Um, SBS40 has an unknown etiology. Interestingly, in our data, that was the only one that was associated with, with a particular um, histology. It was associated with endometrial tumors. Um, but the cosmic signatures available to us matched our samples pretty well. 80% um, of our samples had you know, one signature with at least 50% contribution. So we felt like 
they, they represented our data pretty well. So what we are going to use these for is, is a way to kind of incorporate our clinical information with this genomic data. And so here I show you some variables just in a, a univariate analysis we did. Um, and these are variables that are significantly associated with survival. So we had a couple others um, that, that were not associated with survival. Um, histologic subtype, MSI or MSS status was also not. Just copy number variation was not independently in univariate analyses associated. Um, nor was myometrial invasion or a couple of those other cosmic signatures back from the previous page, SBS26 or SBS14. But these were um, variables that we included in our final analysis. And so this, this is a classification regression tree analysis. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's used to kind of create to model data that you want to classify subjects into various risk categories, and this would be risk of death. And here you can see from um, this that we've got six different classes. The first split you see, so it's all samples up at the top, the first split you see is based on stage, and that is exactly what we would expect from a clinical perspective. In fact, I think I would be worried um, if we didn't see it split by stage. And so, um, in those with this stage three disease, I keep trying to point to my screen, sorry. Um, you can see that the, the next split in those with stage three does incorporate one of the cosmic signatures. And so it's the SBS 10 signature. So those who, uh, or I'm sorry, the SBS 6 signature, those who have 10% or less of the signature kind of in their little portfolio of signatures in their, their individual cancer genome um, have, a, have a worse prognosis. And that's that black line you see at the bottom of the graph. Uh, there was 58 people at the beginning of this that fell into that risk categorization. Um, looking at the stage two or one or two tumors, um, there you see that age becomes the next um, stratification variable. And for those who are under the age of 70, SBS uh, 10A and having 10% um, or greater contribution is a better prognostic factor. And you can see that, in fact, that's kind of the best of our group. So if you're early stage, under age 70, and your you know, tumor profile is at least 10% or greater that of SBS 10A, you have the best prognosis. And then the final split here um, comes with tumor size. And you know, that separates kind of these middle purple and gold categories here, um, where the smaller tumors, as you again might imagine, have a little bit of a better prognosis. So we're still kind of refining this interpretation. You know, we haven't been able to validate this in other data sets because we've, you know, like TCGA, we haven't been able to find you know tumor size. It's it's been challenging, but um, I think this shows just kind of the potential of integrating both clinical and genomic data. So with that, I'll get you to my takeaways, my final points. Um, the landscape of somatic mutations in these high-grade cancers, it's far from defined, but it's really important to figure this out because you know we've it's been pretty stagnant in terms of survival, and these are the tumors that we die from. We, we should probably consider some other tumor characteristics along with um, these mutations. I think we will see, you know, um, signatures, so to speak, with, as we did with MSI, I think you'll start seeing it with things like tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. You know, maybe someday if we can figure out what sorts of exposures we should be looking at, um, we might see signatures that are mutational signatures that are aligned with those. Um, I think some of this may differ by ancestry. We've we've been kind of poking in um, to this slowly, and I think we may see some significant differences. Um, maybe not necessarily in frequencies, but perhaps even in looking a little bit deeper in the actual um, exons that are mutated in in each gene. And then, you know, lastly, you know, I think the landscape is potentially influenced by things we have yet to measure. I know this talk has been mostly focused on 
you know, survival and looking at the, the current landscape of things, but really everything we need to, or everything we know about endometrial cancer, um, epidemiology, what are the risk factors and so on, um, are really being driven by these much more frequent, better survival, low grade endometrial cancers. And so that isn't to say we've done some work um, with the epidemiology of endometrial cancer consortium um, has put out some work looking at uh, kind of the overlap of factors associated with with type two and um, type one cancers. There's definitely overlap between the groups, but I think we're probably missing um, a lot of important variables, and we just don't have those data yet. I want to end this by saying thank you to my wonderful collaborators at Wayne State. I mentioned Dr. Aletha Mia, pathologist, Julie Berner runs our tissue core, um, Doug Craig and Greg Dyson, bioinformatics and um, biostatistician, and Juliana and Julie, our research assistant um, extraordinaires. Henry Ford Health System, my um, colleague there, Mohammed Al Sheikh has been wonderful. He is a radiation oncologist. He brings a much different perspective. You know, we're able to look at recurrence and some other variables we wouldn't be able to without his help. And then the team at, at I know about health system, and the cancer center there, um, doctors Bateman and Conrads, um, doctors Nicole Moore, and then uh, Dr. Larry Maxwell. He's actually one of you know, the first papers I started reading looking at endometrial cancer and racial disparities were papers out of Dr. Maxwell's group. And he was doing a lot of that work through the Department of Defense. And so it's it's just been a really great experience being able to bring his perspective. You know, he's also he's a gynecologic oncologist. So we've got a really strong team across a bunch of disciplines. And I'm I'm grateful that they let me present their work. So with that, I am happy to take questions. Thank you, Michelle, for presenting about your endometrial tumor sequencing research today. So before we begin with Q&A, I just want to encourage people to submit any questions that they may have via the Q&A or the chat boxes. Um, so we have a few different questions for you. One is, uh, well, a few actually are around um, sort of subtyping endometrial cancer and maybe getting some clarification. So you mentioned in type 2 endometrial cancer, the potential for lymphogenic metastatic spread, that it's high. Could you maybe elaborate what you mean by lymphogenic spread? Oh boy, yeah. Um, <laughs> the short answer to that is no, not well in any clinical <laughs> terms. Um, but it's it's really just more about the um, the overall metastatic potential of these tumors. That when you know, and again, I'm not a clinician, you know, or a surgeon who is doing these, you know, surgeries. But it's it's really when you know they open somebody up and looking and you know, look at you know, the field, um, that they, these are not small, not small confined tumors, that the spread is really, they describe it as almost like a shotgun um, spread, that it's just kind of everywhere and that the infiltrates are, you know, across all tissue types. You know, it's interesting, uh, somewhere around 10% of, of endometrial cancers um, have a concurrent ovarian cancer diagnosis. That's been an area of just uh, kind of odd interest of mine. And some of it's because of, you know, ovarian cancer kind of has that same phenotype. So, no, I'm sorry, I can't answer that in uh, a very clinically accurate way. So, I'll try to stay away from it. <laughs> okay, I think you answered um, some questions perhaps about it though. So, thank you for that. Um, along those lines of, you know, these subtypes, did you, when you looked at the top mutated genes, did you split this by type 1 and type 2? And, and if you did, did you see any differences? Or if you didn't, why, why do you think that might not be the right approach? Yeah, so all of these tumors would fall into kind of the type 2 category with mm -hmm. the exception of those, those um, endometrioid tumors. Well, so this is the problem with with the type one, type two classification. Those high grade endometrial tumors, which you know make up almost half of our data set, don't neatly or cleanly fall into um, that classification system. So we actually, what we did was, you know, more so it was that the split that I showed a little bit later that we looked at. We brought you in based on grade. 
So you had to be high grade endometrioid. Um, we excluded low grade endometrioid. So essentially, we excluded most of the type one tumors. Right, and as you get definition. knowledge about the somatic mutations, the classifications may not fit as neatly as they used to, right? Right, and you know, like you know, the TCGA showed for that last group, the serous like. You know, those had tumors that were primarily serous, but they had low grade endometrioid, high grade endometrioid, you know, mm -hmm. so they had a mix. And what's really interesting is, you know, so you, you're, di you know, somebody's diagnosed with low grade endometrioid cancer, and they think that the prognosis is pretty well. The question is, is if, if they're kind of the unlucky people that really fall into that serous like, um, subtype, you know, based on TCGA, they would probably benefit from more aggressive treatment, but we just don't know it yet because the classification systems that we're using are just based, you know, purely on pathology at this point. So that's the goal is to take, you know, some of these more aggressive phenotypes, identify which ones can be more aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, another uh, set of questions is to do with the, the tissue sample and storage. Um, so do you see any correlation of the FFP artifacts with age of samples, or do you see changes in the mutation rate with the time that the tissues are stored? Yeah, we looked at all of that and we did not. Um, you know, one thing that we, you know, it, it seemed really just sample depend, dependent. You know, we had some samples that were perfectly great from, you know, the year 2000, and we had some from 2013 that were not so much. So it was probably more, you know, the how they were processed and perhaps even the tech who processed them. You know, if, if we could go back and do this with this type of, of project in mind for the end game, the other thing that we would probably want to do is look really closely at the amount of time the tissue, you know, was soaking in the fixation. Um, and that that's something, you know, there's um, there's standards, of course, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, we went so far as to look and see at what year did those standards change. I don't remember the details now, but um, you know, we didn't see any correlations there either. So, no, but ideally you would record all of that information. I think actually, ideally, you would just get fresh frozen, but <laughs> it's it's not. Possible. Not always feasible. Yeah, I guess along those lines, um, and this is sort of a very, a very broad question, but you know, given your experiences and some of the issues you encountered, what would you advise for people who are starting up these types of somatic sequencing studies? So you've mentioned yeah. a few, but I want to make sure that you didn't have any others that you wanted to mention. Yeah, no, I do see one in the chat, Mike, and this is a pathology question that I can actually answer. If I didn't, if I was not given co-authorship on this paper, I analyzed the data. It's it's about the mixed tumors. Was it you know ten percent is kind of the threshold that's been used as to if you've got an endometrioid tumor and you've got ten percent or greater serous component, it's called mixed. That was how it was defined. So um, no, how would I do this again? Um, you know, I, there's yeah, no good answer for that. I would double the size of of my. Um, initial population, if possible, mm -hmm. just because, as I showed you, there was kind of fallout every step of the way. And I felt like I was realistic when I wrote the grant and I said, okay, you know, we're going to lose 20% of these, you know, um, and, you know, we should still be able to get to, to 500, um, you know, but we, we lost a lot more. And so that would be, you know, one thing I would say is to really overestimate if you have to what you're going to lose. Um, the other pieces there, you know, there's some, you know, repair kits and there's some different things that you can do along the way when, um, you know, during, you know, extracting the DNA and when you're doing some of the pre-processing before it gets to the sequencing point, none of them appear to be perfect though. And, you know, and, and by perfect, I mean, you still have artifacts Maybe it can remove you know, some of, of the TDCs, but or the C to T's, but um, it, it doesn't, it, it has no way of controlling for, say, the orientation strand bias. So there's really, I wouldn't go back and change that. Um, I think those, you know, those are just lessons learned along the way. Mm -hmm. Thank you.
Um, there's a more technical question in, in terms of trying to distinguish between passenger and driver mutations. Is that something that you did with like mute six CV or a similar package? Yep, we haven't gotten that deep into it yet, but I think absolutely. Um, like I said, some of the, the more deeper digging we need to do is, is to look at the mutations, not just basically if there is a mutation in any of the axons, we just we called it a mutated tumor. Um, but we haven't yet gone back and um, classified the type of mutation. Um, and, and certainly we haven't had the chance to do the deep dive in to try to figure out how many of these are passenger versus driver. But no, that's, that's a great question. Um, I have another question here. Um, there's a lot of people appreciating the talk, by the way, <laughs> so I want to mention that. Um, but if the mutations observed in P10 could be a second hit um, for women with potential germline P10 mutations or Cowden syndrome, so do you consider familial cancer history in the study? Yeah, so um, I love that question. Thank you. So we, if it was noted in the um, you know, in their medical records. So this is all retrospective. So that's another limitation. I would do this prospectively. I'll go back to the last question. Do this prospectively, but you have to get like 20 years of funding. So good luck. But um, no, I we don't have that information about familial history of cancer. Cowden syndrome is you know relatively rare. Um, you know, but we don't know about that. We don't know about Lynch. We don't know about several of those. But that's that's a good thought. Um, there's another question about the survival analysis and whether you considered treatment in that analysis, um, partially considering that MSI, high MSI might re might respond to immunotherapy, for instance. Yeah. So all of these tumors, um, all of these women and the tumors from these women um, are prior to. Um, immunotherapy is being kind of standard of care. You know, that's really just been in the last couple of years. Um, we do have, I think, I think right now I can say there's only four women in, in all of those um, that have had any immunotherapies. Um, we do have access to those, those data um, for the most part, you know, so all these women had surgery. Um, for the most part, you know, we've got the radiation data too that we can look at, but our Treatment data is is really close amongst all groups. Um, there was a paper that was published a couple of months ago. Um, Julianne is the the first author on it, and um, you know she she gives a little bit more detail about um, you know some of the treatment variables. But I'm trying to recall what we found from there specific to radiation. Um, and I don't, but what I do recall from there is that uh, better than 90% of these women received NCCN guideline um, care. So that's a really you know, high proportion of women. You don't see that when you're looking at a population based sample of women. So I think, you know, most of the treatment for these women is so standardized. Um, I'm not surprised to see it not showing up um, in our survival analysis. Great, thank you. Um, well, thanks again for your time today and for a talk that stirred up a lot of questions. Uh, I apologize that we weren't able to get to all of the questions, but um, so that we don't go over too long, I'd like to turn it back over now to Leah. Thanks again, Dr. Cote. Very welcome, thanks for having me. Great, thank you for uh, an excellent presentation and thank you everyone for your participation in today's uh, Seek Space webinar. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank Dr. Cote for, for the presentation. And our next Seek Space webinar is on November 9th from 3 to 4 p.m. and will feature a presentation on lessons learned sequencing and familial glioma uh, by Dr. Melissa Bondi and Matthew Bainbridge. So you may register at our website now. And we also, um, you may also view some of our previous webinars at our website. And with that, I wanna thank you and hope that all of you have a great day. Thank you. <laughs>